I think our sport is unfortunately rife with people who are, we'll say, um, tripping over dollars to pick up dimes, mm. right? They're looking for that little, mm-hmm. whatever, that marginal gain or that 1% or they're chasing Watts. And the reality is they don't have their found their fundamentals okay. really dialed. So if you're considering fasted training or carb restricted training, I think it has its place. Depends a bit on, again, the physiology of the athlete. If you're heavily, heavily glycolytic, meaning you are a sugar burner and for years you've gotten up and had um, cornflakes for breakfast or pop tarts, and then you go out and ride your bike for five hours and you're really good at short hills and you tend to suck at long climbs and you're pretty explosive and maybe you're one of the faster sprinters on your group, then all the, and you're also kind of muscly. These are things that tell us you're probably more glycolytic, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's not good or bad, but what are the demands of your event? Now you're training for something really long and your goal is to win a 200 kilometer road race or, you know, whatever, or do a multi-day stage race. Okay. So we need to improve your ability to economize. And we, so we might do that with some carb restricted training. We might do that by forcing your body to run off fat. And for an athlete who's heavily on the glycolytic cycle, their, their VLA max is really high. That can be a pretty rough curve. So we need to be careful with it. Right. Um, we also need to understand some of the subtlety of it in that an athlete who, if we have two athletes side by side and they weigh about the same and they have roughly the same CDA and they do a four hour ride in zone two or aerobic endurance. And, but one is highly glycolytic and the other is highly aerobic. The highly glycolytic rider in that aerobic zone will relatively speaking, even though they're about the same speed, uh, sorry, the same CDA and making the same power in our hypothetical example, they're working at a higher rate aerobically because they're training the aerobic system. And that's not a strength of that rider. So they're bordering on maybe high inigo zone two or low zone three tempo pace Mm -hmm. for the whole ride. And they're also burning more sugar than the aerobic athlete who's burning more fat. So the glycolytic athlete is burning more calories, right? Mm -hmm. So it gets, well, did I say that right? No, they're not burning more calories. No, they would be making the same amount of the same amount of KJs actually in their ride, because if they have the same CDA hypothetically, and they do the same ride, they both get 3,200 KJs or whatever it is. It's just that one of them will burn a lot more sugar, the glycolytic Mm -hmm. athlete, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so that engine is running effectively at a higher RPM. That's the way to think about it. It's like Mm -hmm. they're driving in second gear all day and the aerobic athlete is burning, is running in fourth Mm -hmm. at the same speed. So their aerobic engine is air quotes, more efficient. And so these two, this is why Sebastian Weber at Inside, for example, says that we should really be basing prescription training zones off of VO2 and shades of VO2 rather than FTP, because FTP would give us the same training prescription for these two athletes Mm -hmm. if they had the same threshold. But if we look at VO2, then we see a much different picture because the glycolytic athlete will normally have a lower VO2. It would also be, go ahead. Well, so their zone two pace, if we're strict, if we're strict about, we want them to train in zone two, the glycolytic athlete should be going slower, Mm -hmm. right? Otherwise, or if they go the same speed as the aerobic athlete, we accept that they're effectively training harder, Mm -hmm. right? Um, There was a really good article that illustrated this point further. I'll send you a link to it later. If you, if you haven't seen it, I think I've got it bookmarked. It was about how some, I don't remember who it was. Some, some sports scientists did some analysis of Marcel Kittle's tour de France and they realized how much harder the tour was for Kittle than it was even for the riders who are leading GC. Oh, wow. Because That's if you think about it, super interesting because both GC riders and Kittle have to be at the front on all the sprint days. And ostensibly they're hiding as much as they can in the pack for the beginning of the long sprint days. But imagine now that same example of the aerobic rider versus the glycolytic rider, which is Kittle versus our GC rider, which is, I don't know, Froome from that era. Right. Mm-hmm. So they're going up a climb at 10% while Froome is at, you know, 55 or 60% of his capacity, but Kittle who weighs, you know, 40 kg more or whatever. <laughs> and he's glycolytic. He's running his engine, like at maximum, the entire climb, probably on every climb of the whole grand tour, he's basically close to maximum. Mm -hmm. And he has to be even on days where he's out the back because he has to make the time cut. But then on the long sprint days, Froome just gets shielded by his team all day, whereas Kittle has to race at the end. 